Well, a good morning to all of you. Glad to, glad to see your friendly faces. Although I confess in my sermon I might abuse some of you, so, uh, and, and Terry's already laughing like, yeah, if he abuses somebody, I'll be first in line. And Dan, don't relax back there either. <laughs> you know, for over 20 years now, I have had a, um, a custom on almost every Thursday night where I have gone over to a senior citizen's mobile home about half a mile away from me, and I have played the game of bridge with a group of seniors, and uh, we put a little money on the line, not much, and have a great time, and, and so on and so forth. Well, over the years, I've gotten to know these ladies uh, uh, fairly well, and one of them who is a very staunch Catholic by the name of Pat, said, how would you and Sandy like to come to church with me this Sunday because we have a couple of things that are special. She said, we have a wonderful choir and a lot of the service is going to be devoted to Christian music and then we have a special meal after this is over and uh, you could come and enjoy the music and uh, eat the, the meal afterwards and I said, we'd love to. So we found out exactly where her church was over in, in uh, Orangevale. And uh, so the next Sunday morning, why we ventured over there and met her 10, 15 minutes before services out front. And we went in and proceeded to have a seat. Now, the music was great and had a message. The message was fine. We got down to the end of the service and it was time for communion, or maybe they call it Eucharist or whatever. I don't know how exactly the Catholics address it. But at any rate, as they were preparing to pass the, the grape juice and the little wafers and all that, she leaned over and whispered in my ear, now please understand that this is for Catholics only. Please don't partake. I thought, well, far be it from me to cause trouble to anybody. Uh, so the communion material was passed. I didn't partake, neither did Sandy. And I thought to myself, what an odd sequence we have here. Uh, number one, the, the, the communion, the bread and the wine, is supposed to be the one thing that unifies Christians everywhere. It's a celebration of Christ uh, shedding his blood and dying for us and offering himself, and we can be partakers in that when we take the communion. And to say to another brother or sister in Christ, you're not welcome, is a strange thing. Now, I think for most of you that are my age, older, or around that time, you know, it hasn't been that long ago, and I go back to my childhood, when the Catholic Church had a very strict view that it was pretty much my way or the highway. And uh, this was more fittingly illustrated over in Ireland where they used to have this sectarian warfare between the Catholics and the Protestants who didn't much like each other. And it's only been in the past few years that the church has become more ecumenical. I think a couple of the popes have bent over backwards to reach out to other people and be more inclusive and so on. And, and I don't know that, of course, you won't run into, I would hope that uh, anymore. But apparently they still feel certain things are reserved for Catholics only. And when you come to our church, one of them uh, is, is communion. Now, I thought to myself uh, in considering the sermon I'm going to give today, a uh, section of scripture in the book of Romans, how 
we can encounter, without looking very far, um, Christians, fellow brothers and sisters of ours, they could be in another church, they could be in our church here, uh, who, who have certain, certain beliefs, certain things that they do in their life, certain things that they hold near and dear, and we look at it and scratch our heads and say, why do you put yourself under that burden? Because you know what? When, when I look at what does Jesus Christ require? Well, what is the bare bedrock requirement to be a Christian? Well, first of all, that you believe that Jesus was who and what he said he is. He was, you know, the father's son. He is going to be our soon coming king. He's our Lord and our master. He is also our savior. You, you believe that. And as a result of embracing that, uh, you became, as one of the songs we sang, a servant. Jesus said he expected us to be servants. So we go out living a life, hopefully reflecting the love of Jesus for humanity. And we, we go out to our neighborhoods and our friends and wherever we have, and, and we try to reflect that love. Now, you'll notice in here, there is nothing said about your name, and nothing said about your building, and nothing said about your history, and nothing said about a lot of other things that we're going to consider. And yet, these can be roadblocks that Christians can throw up that really make getting along with another Christian tough. And the Apostle Paul also confronted this problem uh, in his letter to the book of the church at Rome. Because you see, Rome had apparently been started years before after the day of Pentecost. And if you remember, all these uh, pilgrims from all over everywhere came to Jerusalem to celebrate and the Holy Spirit came. And so you had these, these Jews who went out everywhere, wherever they had come from, taking the gospel with them, this newfound love of Jesus that they had been called to and exposed to and baptized in and so on. Now, uh, this was something that the church in Rome had, but the church in Rome had a, had a unique challenge in that it wasn't just expatriate Jews. There were Gentiles there. And what are we going to do about these Jews and these Gentiles? Because we've we got two different backgrounds here. We've got these Gentiles who have come out of pagan idol worship, temple prostitutes, so on and so on and so on. And then we've got these Jews who are staunchly, you know, into the law and, and as a part of their national heritage, don't want to give that up. And so how... how how are we going to get along? Are we going to tear ourselves apart? Or as Paul is going to address, is there a better way? And so let's turn to, to Romans chapter 14 with that background. And uh, let's, let's look at a few things that the Apostle Paul said that I think we can make an application to our lives today. So remember, he's addressing the Roman church, Jews and Gentiles, and it says, Except him whose faith is weak and without passing judgment on disputable matters. Now, I already gave you the basics of the Christian faith. Now, if you're going to go out there and find other things that you are want to add in like barnacles to a boat, disputable matters as to what they may or may not mean, uh, fringe elements that aren't going to get you, uh, you know, <laughs> any further into the kingdom than the things we've already talked about. Paul said, look, if you've got people that just want to hold on to certain things and they don't want to let them go, and we're not talking here obviously about sin or morality, or, or, you know, Paul addressed that in other areas. He said, don't judge them, condemn them, and don't sit around 
arguing and trying to convert them and so on and so on and so on. Now, I had this, this um, kind of a strange analogy I'd like to give you where I'd like to contrast the Mike Swaggerty who stands before you today giving this sermon with the Mike Swaggerty who came into this denomination back in uh, the fall of 1964 and what if Swaggerty today meets up with Swaggerty now both of them are Christians both of them are baptized both of them have the Holy Spirit but how long is it going to take until some disputable matters are going to arise uh, you know you know and I, I can see already because uh, as Paul is going to talk about, uh, and we'll go on to verse 2, one man's faith allows him to eat everything. Another man whose faith is weak can only, uh, you know, eats only vegetables. Now, let me tell you why he specified this. There was not that it was such a vegetarian, you know, that you ran across who, I guess, like real died in the world, Adventists don't eat meat. Uh, no, there was something behind this. It's because a lot of the meat that was out there for the market had come from the sacrifices that were given at the pagan temples. And it had been offered to idols. And then it was sold in the marketplace. And, and so to somebody who had come out of that, the last thing I want to have anything to do with is, is, is meat that came from one of their pagan idol worships and I don't want to eat that stuff. Well, now, did the, did the, did the idol really taint the meat? Uh, did it change the protein? <laughs> did it change the fiber? Did it change? Uh, no. But if, if, if someone, uh, you know, faith allows him to eat it like, I don't care where it came from. Just make mine medium rare, would you? Yeah. That's all I care about. And, and uh, you know, if you got some A1 sauce, that would be good, too. All right, that, that's what I'm looking for. So one man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak. And when it says weak, it means he just can't partake in something. He can't get past it. That individual only will eat vegetables because he's afraid from where the meat may have come. So he chooses to be a vegetarian so as not to become tainted. Now, Paul says this, the man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. See, God, God's not concerned about the meat. What God is concerned about is your faith in his son, Jesus Christ. God is concerned about the Holy Spirit that is in you. And Paul says, who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. And he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. So we are servants of Christ. He is able to make a stand. So to sit and pick somebody apart because of certain you know, beliefs that they may hold don't do that Paul said so I go back to the old Mike Swaggerty and the new Mike Swaggerty now if the old one invited me over to dinner I can bet your boots there wouldn't be any pork present <laughs> and hopefully I wouldn't invite him over not realizing he really held this and, and, and serve him a nice pork chop because he can't do that he just can't do that or you know, maybe I say, hey, how about we go have a round of golf Saturday afternoon? I can't do that. Because you see, from sunset Friday night to sunset Saturday night, that's holy time. And I don't think I ought to be out there running around on a golf course, uh, you know, on God's holy time. Okay. So what, what do I do? Do I, do I make fun of the old person? See, because that's the way I thought at one time. For decades, days meant something to me. Meat meant something to me. Okay, and, and trust me, I was a firm believer in Jesus as my Savior. 
and I had been baptized and hands had been laid on me and I had received the Holy Spirit, just like the new version. But I, I just, I couldn't get myself to eat meat. In fact, is after our church denomination back, what was it, 1994, 95, right in there, went through these, this doctrinal upheaval we went through. And, and we saw that all these entanglements of the law of Moses were not binding on a Christian today. I tell you, it was a long time before I would put a bite of pork in my mouth. Because I, uh, uh, and, and for a long time, as my, ma my wife will attest, uh, uh, I saw that sun coming on Friday night. <laughs> And you know what I'm saying, old habits die hard. And my wife and I to this day still follow a custom that uh, we started when our kids were little after we were married. And that is we made the, the most special meal we could afford, which generally was our one night of the week to have steak. And so if you came and saw what Sandy and I eat on Friday night, it's still steak and a potato, a baked potato. We, yeah, well, I, we, that's sun, Friday night is steak night. Well, where did that come from? Well, that came from the good old days when, when we wanted to make it special because this was God's holy time and you, you saved the best and, and so on and so forth. Okay? So, all right. If that's what a person wants to do, then fine. Don't judge them. Don't condemn them. Don't make fun of them. Don't get in a big argument about it. Don't try to look down your nose on them and tell them they, they, they ought to, you know, get real and come around and, and all these other things. Because I, 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 as many of you do, I still have people I talk with who are in what we affectionately call the old church. In other words, they go to a, some offshoot of the Worldwide Church of God, as we were called in those days. And they still keep the Sabbath and they still keep clean and unclean meats. And by the way, what somebody told me today that uh, today is the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, for, for the Jews, Feast of Trumpets. And, and uh, somebody asked me if I was going to blow the shofar. And I said, well, first of all, I don't have a shofar. And secondarily, I don't think I know how to blow it if somebody gave me one. So no, you ain't going to get any shofar being blown today. Uh, but that's okay. But there, there, are, there are folks gathering today, not just because it's the Sabbath, but because they want to celebrate the Feast of Trumpets, the second coming of Christ. Won't be long till they'll be fasting on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And then shortly after that, probably a good many will pack it up for eight days and they'll take off for some feast site somewhere and, and, and there they will be. And they absolutely feel as a point of conviction, I have got to do this. No way around it. And trust me, I once held exactly the same views. I once felt exactly the same way. And uh, we would go off to the Feast of Tabernacles someplace or another. And that's where we'd be. So uh, again... He, he goes on to the consider not just meats now, but, but we're going to go to verse, uh, uh, verse 5 here. One man considers one day more sacred than another. Okay, Saturday is special. The seventh day is special. Or, quite frankly, with many Christians today, Sunday is a special day to them. It's a celebration of the resurrection of Christ. You know, they went to the tomb on the first day of the week, and he's not there. So they hold Sunday virtually in the same way that we used to hold Saturday. Uh, they don't want to get involved with secular things. They want to rest. They want to have a nice meal. They want to go to church. They maybe want to fellowship with some of their friends from the church. And that's the way they want to spend Sunday. Okay, sounds, sounds fine if that's what they choose to do. It said each one should be fully convinced in his own mind uh, uh, about a day. Uh, am I going to bother with it or aren't I? And, and uh, <laughs> I was once asked, well, I thought you gave up, you know, the conviction that uh, 
Saturday was required. So, so why do you still go to a church that meets on Saturday? I say, well, we go to a church that meets on Saturday because it's the only day so far we've been able to find an acceptable hall uh, that, that is a nice surrounding to meet. And this is what our people have known for the years. So we come to church on Saturday to fellowship and pray for each other and hear the word expounded. You know, uh, if, if we had the facility, would we come on Sunday? Fine, let's come on Sunday. But the neither day is sacred one way or the other. It's, it's, again, going back to that bedrock issue of Jesus and belief in him. That's what's sacred, not days. But to some people, they're going to regard one day as special, and uh, they do so to the Lord. And, and when I was Sabbath-keeping, I did it to the Lord. Thought it was an act of worship to him. All right? And he who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And uh, he who abstains... Uh, does so to the Lord, and he gives thanks to God. And, and, and they're different, but in a sense, they're part of the same body. Now, notice this. This is, this is critical. For none of us, he said, lives to himself alone. None of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. And that's what counts. How's it going to end? You know, uh, are, are you a recipient of eternal life or are you not? Uh, that's, that's all that's going to count. Not the day you kept or the meat you eat or didn't eat or whatever. Uh, that isn't going to count. All right. Now, he, he gets down to a, a, the, the real attitude here. For this very reason, okay, it says that Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. And whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord. So Lloyd James sitting here a few weeks ago was the Lord. Lloyd James dead has gone to be with the Lord. He is the Lord. It doesn't matter one way or the other. All right. And the same thing for all of us, uh, whether we live, whether we die, we 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 are gods. And uh, he, he died and returned so that this could be. So you then, why do you judge your brother or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. That's right. Everybody gives account. Warts, wrinkles, and all. But, you know, I, I look at this, and I, I reminded uh, to understand this in, in the total context of God's plan. Judgment has already passed on the people of God. Okay? When you give yourself to Christ, your sins are forgiven past, present, and future. You are one with Christ. So when we say, stand before the judgment seat of Christ, yes, all of us will give account, but with the understanding uh, that the, the accounting has already taken place, we've already been made right with God. And, and you know, that, that is our state as we sit right now. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, and every tongue will confess to God. Now, that <laughs> I think about this verse, and I think about, I wonder when that final judgment day comes, how Putin is going to react to this. And what about old Kim over in North Korea? Uh, is, is he going to want to bow his knee to Jesus? Uh, he's an absolute avowed atheist, persecutes Christians, it's outlawed in his country. If you're going to be a Christian in North Korea, uh, I know uh, Armin gives me copies of the Voice of the Martyrs from time to time. And there are stories about what these people have to go through to try to hold on to their Christian faith in, in, in a land like North Korea. And of course, it's not any better if you're in a solid Muslim place like, let's say, Saudi Arabia or, you know, a place like that. 
you know, you better not be practicing your Christianity openly or you'll be a martyr. Uh, and you better never be caught trying to convert a Muslim to Christianity because that would be anathema. And, and, and so all these folks, they're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. They're going to give account to God himself for what they've done. But then I think, and again, I can't sort out all the details. I can't give you the exact scriptural way this is going to work. But then they're going to be confronted with this reality. Okay, you're dead. Your sins warrant death. But let me introduce you to what my son did for you. Let me introduce you to what I'm offering to you. And instead of death, you can have life. And then they're going to be given an opportunity. I fully believe it. But again, they're going to have to come to the place where they're going to do it God's way. Or certainly it will be the highway. Uh, there, there won't be any ifs, ands, and buts about it. All right, so a couple more verses here. So with all this in mind, the apostle said, with each of us giving account for ourselves, with judgment coming, uh, you know, with Jesus Christ having done what he did for everybody. Therefore, Paul said, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Don't do that. Instead, make up your mind not to put a stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. And that might include something that you see no problem in, but your brother just can't come to the place where they can live with that. And, and uh, that may be it. And it says, as one uh, who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean to itself, but if anyone regards something clean to itself or unclean, then for him it's unclean. In other words, don't defile your conscience. Just because somebody makes a good argument and you, you still can't really bring yourself to eat it, well then don't eat it. Or you feel a certain day, well then fine, do your day. Or, or whatever it may be. And I know... <laughs> Every now and then, you, you've all undoubtedly had this experience. Your doorbell rings or somebody knocks at the door. So you go to the door and you open it up. And here are two nicely dressed, it could be young men in white and dark slacks in the case of Mormon missionaries. Or it could be even a couple of ladies holding their supply of tracts uh, if they're Jehovah's Witnesses. And, and I'm not going to get here about our Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses really Christians and blah, blah. That, that's for God to sort out. I don't, I don't want to get involved with that. But it is not my place to, to rake them over the coals, okay? Um, <laughs> but I, I will say to them um, when, they, when they, they say to you, well, you know, um, uh, are you saved or whatever, I say, yes, I'm saved. I go to church every week. As a matter of fact, I was a career pastor for 50 years. What else would you like to know? Oh. Oh. So I said, you know, I appreciate your concern. I appreciate you asking the question. But I, I, th I think respectfully, you're kind of wasting your time. Oh. And, and, and you know they don't agree with you, but they're kind of stymied at the moment and don't know what else to say. And I say, I wish you well, and I shut the door. But I'm not going to look down on those people. I, I, I realize they're caught up, in my view, in a, in a cult that has so many barnacles on their boat, the whole boat sinking. Uh, but whether or not there's a modicum of a, of a faith in Jesus in there somewhere and, and, and the Holy Spirit working in a very embryonic way uh, to hopefully bring them to a very, that's up to God to decide. I'm not their judge. He can, he can work that out and, uh, you know, he'll, he'll do that in his own good time. So, I bring this message today, certainly from the, the, the book of, uh, of Romans, just so that all of us 
uh, uh, you know, can uh, uh, learn to live with each other's idiosyncrasies. And I told Terry I might pick on him. You know, Ter Terry's got a few idiosyncrasies. I mean, just sometimes the look on his face is an idiosyncrasy. And, and I wonder what's about to leap next, you know. But, but he's my brother in Christ, and I love him, and I know he views me the same way. And barnacles or idiosyncrasies, to the contrary, here we all are. And uh, uh, that's the way it is. So, again... Let's go out uh, in, our, in our daily endeavors and uh, accept those that are in the faith, whatever weaknesses we may perceive they have, and be an encouragement to them and pray for them and, and not be a, a source of division because of certain differences of opinion we may have on certain issues. Please join me in prayer. Our gracious God, we want to thank you so much again for your love and mercy and thank you father that in Christ and with the Holy Spirit we whether Jews or Gentiles or atheists or believers or wherever we may have come from we creator God can um, you know all embrace you and and we can share that harmony of Christians so father I thank you and bless you for all you do and uh, ask these things in Christ's name Amen. Do I detect that more music is on the way? After the benediction. Oh, you want me to do the benediction first? All right. So let's look on the screen here. And may the love of the Father, the tenderness of the Son, and the presence of the Spirit gladden your heart, bring peace to your soul this day and all days. Amen.